Hi, this is Pax Europeana, Günther Fellinger here. I want uh, now to speak about the future of Russia and I want to thank the Forum of Free Nations of Russia for the invitation to attend the event in um, Sweden upcoming and in the future in other events. I would like to participate because I fully endorse that we need a different form of Russia on the other side, east of uh, the European Union and NATO, and I fully support the freedom of the nations of Russia. I'm since a long time promoting uh, this idea and I think the time has now come after this terrible war which Russia unleashed against the um, innocent Ukraine and the punishment must be similar uh, to what happened uh, to the Austrian-Hungarian monarchy uh, that was dismantled after uh, the First World War because of starting the terrible First World War. The same was happening to Yugoslavia and it was dismantled as a punishment uh, to the terrible crimes which Milosevic has started and the same logic is now uh, with um, Putin's war against Ukraine and uh, the future must be of course freedom for the people of Russia in a new structure. You have proposed uh, 40, 34 different uh, nations and uh, new states and I fully endorse that. I personally drafted a paper in 2017 uh, coming up with 28, but it ultimately depends on uh, the development in Russia after the fall of Putin and I hope it will be coming soon. Will it be next year? Will it be 2024? I will talk about it. But first of all, why I am here in front of the Montenegro flag and the Ukraine flag? Because this is my activities today. I am now uh, very much in favor of Montenegro new nation with a long history uh, to be member of uh, the EU and I'm also the chairman of the Austrian NGO and uh, for uh, this uh, on behalf Montenegro goes EU and I'm also very active in Ukraine I live there. To my person first of all maybe for the beginning my name is Günter Fellinger I'm uh, Austrian uh, political activist uh, since I'm 54 and I have uh, been very active um, for the, as a student officer, student activist in the 90s already uh, when uh, the um, communism broke down to support the transformation of southeastern European countries into the modern European democracies. I've been active um, also in Russia in that period. I started to learn Russian and in the 90s I was also part of these youth delegations when the Council of Europe has started uh, to integrate uh, the youth organizations of Russia in the Council of Europe. Been uh, seven times in Russia in the 90s and I didn't go again after Putin took power and I focused my activities in southeastern Europe that's also much closer but to Austria but also there was a lot of positive changes. I worked then as an um, assistant to a European parliamentarian and um, in the centre-right um, in the Brussels before the EU enlargement, the big one of 2004, and I could support many countries uh, to join the EU and NATO in that uh, position. And I was also a student leader in the 90s, some might remember, in EDS, European Democrat Students, 96 to 98. And in that function also I was very active on the transformation of Eastern Europe and I'm very much in favor of that. Yes, I was seven times in Russia, mostly in Petersburg in 98 and in Moscow several times from 1990 onwards actually, on some youth activities, on the two times uh, uh, in Tula and Vladimir with the Council of Europe and several times additionally then politically in Moscow. And I can imagine a total different future if Putin wouldn't have won the power struggle with uh, the center-right wing leaders, with Nemtsov and others and Gaidar. Maybe there would have been a democratic free, free federal Russia possible and I was actually still in my paper in 2017 arguing for a free federal Russia. That means um, a kind of EU style union of um, or whatever United States of America, United States of Russia, all this would have been possible. But with the criminal war in 2022, I changed uh, my direction. And then I discovered on Twitter on uh, Euromaidan Press uh, the report about your activity, and I fully endorse it because what is now necessary is the dismantlement and the de recognition. I have the hashtag XRussia on Twitter, XRussia. I'm also for the end of Iran, by the way. I principally think that uh, countries uh, who are do so such crimes, uh, 
have lost the legitimacy to um, be uh, recognized countries. <laughs> it's very simple. If you commit so atrocious crimes like uh, Russia has committed now, and also when you fail your own people, and let's never no forget what they have done uh, to Chechnya, because that's a very important dividing line, and also a big failure of the West. I will talk about it in a moment. So what we need to do, de-recognize Russia, and the next time there's an opportunity with the fall of Putin in 2024, that's what I believe will come, and I see it on the example of what happened in Yugoslavia. Um, terrible war against Kosovo, NATO intervention, uh, Serbia lost the war in 99, they withdrew, then they had to fake the elections in September 2000, and they had to fake it so hard, uh, so obviously, that the people made a revolution. 2024 is the next moment when Russia will have re elections. The fifth elections, completely illegitimate, of Mr. Putin. He will win because he will do a lot of manipulation. Then it's the moment uh, to make a revolution against him. And then when Russia, the centrifugal uh, forces will be very high, it's time not to repeat the mistake of 1917 or of 1991 and of 94 when the West then was putting a lot of emphasis on unity of Russia. And this was very bad. Yeah? In 1917, only five nations could escape Russia, Poland, the Free Baltic States, Finland. In 1991, it was at least 14 nations who could uh, escape. Yeah, Belarus, uh, he got, uh, they got very soon back again under Lukashenko. That was a terrible situation. But uh, now then, 94, it was also freedom of Chechnya already there. But Putin took it back because we didn't recognize Chechnya, because, oh, so yeah, it's so easy. And unfortunately, it's so easy to talk to one criminal at the top and make business. That's always the problem. And the Americans also, out of concern, and you know, for stability and nuclear, and there's many ma arguments to make. And then they were always in favor of unity of Russia in 1919, and then of unity of Russia in 1991, and of Yugoslavia, by the way, as well and of Iraq and of Syria and of uh, Libya. And it's uh, always a mistake when these countries have no reason for unity, when they are suppressing uh, their nations, when their people are not having living standards which are decent, and when it's a criminal core of the state. Why should we as the West support uh, the unity of such uh, terrible uh, structures? And so I'm completely against it. Yeah? Yes, so it must be dismantled, de-recognize Russia, ex-Russia. What we can learn now from uh, the situation of ex-Yugoslavia, first of all, we have to get acquainted and we have to teach and learn the world that a country like Montenegro exists <laughs> and that it has a right of statehood. <laughs> and this is now very clear, but in the 90s it was not so clear, very much not. The EU has insisted on a referendum with 55% uh, uh, for a yes, only to be valid, and so on and so on. And uh, the same is today still a lot of nations, unfortunately, in the world uh, don't recognize Kosovo, which is also <laughs> recognized by Austria, for example, and by America. So uh, one thing which we, for example, need to agree is that everybody who is now working on this, please recognize Kosovo. <laughs> you know, if uh, Ukraine doesn't recognize Kosovo, it's a big, big, big mistake, and it's delegitimizing the whole effort of what we are doing here and what you are doing here. So it's important Moldova to recognize Kosovo and Georgia to recognize Kosovo. And let's not believe this whole fake propaganda of Putin that the things are um, somehow comparable. And so Crimean, Kosovo and so on. Uh, because there was huge uh, uh, human rights violations in Kosovo. That's the reason for the intervention and that's the reason for the liberation and why they have a case for freedom. So recognize Kosovo, very important. Yes, we can also learn from Yugoslavia that there is always will be and i think it's also you know how many countries that's a big but there will be a revanchist core uh, left yeah like serbia today is a revanchist power uh, and it's uh, aligned with russia in most aspects yeah? not fully but in many aspects and so that similar thing will happen uh, with the core of russia so we have to uh, even uh, much uh, better prepare that the, the independence of the peripheral nations all around in the far east in the caucasus along the volga in the north of Russia is really sustainable and therefore do you need institutional support from the beginning. First of all, we need to teach the world that these nations like Komi, Karelia and Dagestan, that they exist and that they have a right for statehood. It's very important. 
Here come several important institutional issues which I want to raise. First of all, the Council of Europe. Now Russia justified is excluded, but it's important that all these new nations build liaison offices in Strasbourg to be represented Dagestan, at least with an NGO. Free Dagestan in Strasbourg. Very important. Yeah? And that's uh, for all uh, the 30, 34 nations. It must be that the idea of statehood for these new states uh, must be the communicated to the international global media and elite. And best of all in Strasbourg, because there's the Council of Europe and already apply for an association membership instead of Russia, first of all. Secondly, also in Vienna, where the OSCD is, it must be clear that here in the Human Rights Commission, everybody here who works in that field must know that Karelia is a thing, <laughs> that Komi is a thing, that Dagestan is a thing, that Buratia is a thing, and it is a state, not just a thing. <laughs> this must be clear also for the um, people who work in Geneva in the UN, in Vienna, in the OSCD, in Strasbourg, and in Brussels, obviously, where NATO and the EU is at home. So here it is very clear that these concepts must be not with one big map, where all, even for me it's very difficult to decipher all, and please communicate only in English. Yeah? <laughs> the united language of communication in the world is English. I don't speak it very good, <laughs> nobody has to speak it very good, but it's the communication uh, language, so if you want to educate the world that Buratia is an independent state of the future, you need to communicate that in English. So I talked about the Council of Europe, I talked about uh, the question of um, the uh, OSCD in Vienna. Very important is also Sarajevo. Why? Because there is the Regional Cooperation Council. And I'm now fighting for five years, since I worked in Ukraine for years, from 2007 uh, on onwards, that uh, Ukraine and all uh, the post-Soviet countries, whenever I don't like the term, but we have to discuss in that uh, context, all the former Soviet Union countries join as well the ex-Yugoslavian countries in one regional organization which we set up, uh, not me, but the West, the G7 and the famous Dr. Busek, my hero, he set it up. It was called the Stability Pact for Southeastern Europe. It has transformed in its own organization, the Regional Cooperation Council, but Ukraine has not joined. And there is also the other organization for trade, Central European Free Trade Agreement. Here Ukraine has as well not joined. And it's always connected to prior to this war, the Ukrainian arrogance that they don't want to be entangled with the Balkans and with Serbian reluctance and pro-Russianism. So it didn't fit together. But it's all both around the European periphery and all these institutions are very important existing organizations in key sectors, in trade, in politics. Regional Cooperation Council, rcc.int, sefta.int, and they have about 20 sub-organizations for transport politics, for energy politics, for the rule of law, for the military, and so on and so on. And there are wonderful organizations like the Adriatic Charter for the military, the Transport Treaty of Southeastern Europe, and the um, rule of law organizations, and the police cooperation, the military organization, and everything is uh, basically there. And so the logic is. This existing infrastructure of regional sector cross party cross uh, regional organizations is very important. Why? And now, first of all, that all uh, the former ex Soviet Union countries join them. <laughs> and then, the moment there is independence, the newly emerging countries from ex Russia can join them as well. <laughs> so, then the infrastructure is there to Europeanize. And I'm talking, you know, the future is European regulatory al alignment for all the countries which emerge out of Russia. Please don't take over any kind of Chinese standards or what Indian standards or whatever there is in the world out there, American standards. No, they must be technically, and this is very important because I'm also a technical assistance expert. Yeah? You need to align regulatory, technical standards, product standards, and that's really very important because it covers basically every aspect of human life and of economy. And this is very important, uh, align with European standards in transport, infrastructure, energy, rule of law, etc., etc. For this you need help. And there will be a lot of countries emerging potentially, and they all need to be integrated in this existing infrastructure, which is there already. <laughs> and I could not understand why the Ukrainians don't understand what I'm saying. You have to join this uh, infrastructure. I can. I have made many tweets, and uh, I have this website online where it's all explained, but you can take a look yourself and I published this article 
already in 2018 with Andreas Umland's help in uh, the European Council of Foreign Relations and in the Atlantic Council, what Ukraine can learn from the Balkans. Because before uh, the newly emerging countries can learn something from the Balkans, we have to first integrate Ukraine successfully in NATO, in the EU, and in all these structures. And it would be very helpful to be in all these uh, preparatory mechanisms. I call it the backdoor to the EU. Yeah, now anyhow, EU is already Ukraine is already candidate status. But the same is true for all the other countries. Yeah, especially we have to make sure that uh, Belarus moves to the west and joins EU and NATO as well. And of course, also Armenia to break it out of the CSDO and the uh, and this um, anti-EU mechanism and they all have to join this preparatory mechanism which is already existing in Sarajevo or in other capitals of Southeastern Europe because some of them are in Belgrade. And there was a big debate now to shift the energy uh, secretariat from Vienna uh, towards, um, towards Kiev, but the Serbs have stopped it. So I know it's complicated, but this is very important yeah, because that's really what uh, we ha can do and prepare the institutional framework for the moment of crack. When the moment of crack will come, I said, I hope 2024, we had a debate, some think it's earlier, some think it's later, but the moment of crack has, ca has uh, to come and will come. And then it's a question, is the political preparatory work already there for uh, the world to understand that there is a thing like Dagestan or in Burazia and it will be free and it will be a republic and it will be independent? And then the question is what to do with it? <laughs> because countries cannot go from one time from uh, Russia to uh, NATO. <laughs> Not from one, one day, it takes 15 years, maybe for an ex-Russian country, 30 years. Yeah? With Poland, it took 15 years, with the ex-Yugoslavian country, 20 years, and now with the ex-Soviet Union countries, maybe 30 years. Yeah? So it is a lot of preparation. You have to also sell it to the European audience. Some of them have a future in uh, the EU, politically in NATO, some maybe not. I don't know how far this will go and how many countries will develop. That remains to be seen. And this always depends on the will of the people there if they want to do it. But the regulatory alignment that is basically in the ultimate case the alternative to the EU membership, uh, full EU membership might be European political community, uh, for sure the EU customs union. And I have mentioned also the currency alignment. Because you can expect a lot of currency crises in uh, emerging Russia, in a in dismantling of Russia, or in a breakup of Russia, and then you have to have a currency offer, and that's the euro, obviously, and not the dollar. So for this space must be clear the euro, and that's why I'm calling so often for Ukraine to adopt the euro, like Montenegro has done it, like Kosovo has done it. Because now in the war it's really a big crisis what economically is happening and to integrate in the currency system, in the custom system. I mean, that's the core of economic integration. The EU is then the last bit and the defense union, the last, the highest level. But the starting point is a free trade agreement, is a customs union, a monetary union, and then a political union. So I don't know if the long-term future of Buratia of Kazakhstan, let's compare them because they're all Central Asian countries will be uh, EU member, I don't think so, NATO member, I don't think so. But they can be global partners of NATO, yes, like we have Japan as a global partner. They can be with a free trade agreement like we have with Kazakhstan now, and but we don't have with a lot of Central Asian countries, and we should have them. And then we could have also them in the customs union, theoretically, because we have Turkey in the customs union, or we have a separate customs union with Turkey. So that's really very important things because then it works as well. And when <coughs> there is a, a realistic scenario where the decision makers are convinced, let's say Buratia can be like um, Kazakhstan or <laughs> like Uzbekistan, <coughs> when there is a vision to be shared and when there is a credible EU support mechanism ready via Council of Europe, please all, that's very important uh, also for the strategy to work all the countries of Central Asia must also join the Council of Europe, like they are in the OSCE already. <laughs> so that's very logic. Yeah? I, I advocate for that for a long time. And uh, to have all this uh, regional cooperation mechanism extended to all uh, the post-Soviet countries, including especially Ukraine, but then also to offer these institutions already linguistically and technically prepared for the first new countries to develop. And so that's the logic which I think we should work together for. 
How it will happen, I'm also not having a glass bowl to see directly the future, but I think we, we need to institutionally, economically, and especially in this, yeah, institutionally to prepare uh, for mm, this breakup. And we need to communicate it very well and that this is uh, the future. This is a good future because the people of Russia, the people, the 145 million which are living there now, they don't live in, uh, they live in terrible conditions, forced into this war now, but also before they live in abjunct poverty a lot. We have not the elite of a few people in Petersburg and Moscow. So that's really something, it's a much better future for them. Of course, and there is also a danger, like in ex Yugoslavia, that there will be a lot of regional internal breakup wars, like we had uh, four of them. That's uh, possible, and there's this nuclear aspect, and it must be denuclearized, and you know, that probably it will be uh, zooming in into Russia, and uh, that's a possibility, like it happened in the case of 91, when the nuclear weapons were concentrated on Russia, but maybe we learn from that, because have we seen it was not a very good idea to give Russia the um, UN Security Council, that should be any uh, veto seat, that should be frozen immediately, a rule giver cannot be a rule taker, and we may hopefully don't repeat the mistake to give it this kind of core uh, European Russia emerging, and then the security seat and all the nuclear weapons. Of course, you know how to take uh, nuclear weapons, but it should be negotiated, obviously, with huge, uh, important financial help. Because the breakup of Russia will be also very expensive. I'm advocating in my paper already that we pay up to 1% uh, of uh, the mm, EU GDP for the help of the transition of Russia in something new. At that time I was still for a federation, but now I'm for 34 or 28, the exact number you will have to determine because you know better. But uh, we need to advocate for a substantive uh, preparation financially from the West and also for partnership agreements. What's now already happening, and I advocated for that as well for a long time, is that specific European countries help specific oblasts, uh, Bundesländer, regions of Ukraine in the reconstruction, like Austria will do that for Saporizhia and devote money and support for it. But what needs to happen, already now it must be discussed, and I have already made a proposal in my paper, that uh, these new uh, 34 states, they all have a twin, a partner in the European Union or in the United States, and basically one f uh, state of the United States and one EU member or some other EU countries to build a lasting partnership with one of the emerging new states of Russia. Already now it can be done on NGO label. Let's say Burazia makes a partnership with Azerbaijan, for example, there might be some links. Yeah? But then, for example, uh, the, um, let's say um, uh, Karelia makes a partnership with Finland. That's quite logical. Yeah? Komi with Sweden. And then um, others, like Siberia, makes a partnership uh, with, um, let's say, uh, Spain. Yeah? Or, um, you know, do you find the co there can be, I have made uh, more logical couples and twins already, uh, like Spain was with Vladivostok, I remember, and there was um, then, um, uh, yeah, Kalmykia, I um, uh, partnered with, uh, it was uh, Albania, no? I don't remember exactly all that, because now I make the video without a, a, a written script. But, you know, the idea is that we now already make a determination from your side, from the Forum of Free Nations, yeah? You basically decide which country in Europe and which federal state of the United States should uh, partner with one of the new countries. Yeah, there are 50 states in the US, you, so you can choose. Yeah. Maybe one will have two, doesn't matter. Uh, but uh, then there were 27 at the moment, but we have other countries like the UK. The UK can, for example, the region of Stalingrad, I propose that one. And there can be um, uh, Kuban, can be with Italy. You know, it can be some logic and so. You can decide on your side, I would do that as a free nation and then make a headquarter of the Association of Kuban, Free Kuban in Rome, <laughs> and then of uh, Free Vladivostok in Madrid. Of course, it's a lot of people in the beginning, maybe it will be just one active uh, person, but uh, to uh, bring the idea forward that all these Western countries really significantly support uh, the independence of these countries and then a partnership and the development into a modern European economy and democracy, because that should be the plan. And, you know, of course, also Japan and uh, China and India, everybody should contribute, yeah? 
But you know what cannot be, and it's very important from the beginning. You know, countries normally break up according to the internal regional division lines, yeah, and that's what can be inter international recognized. Yeah, and there will be no change of the external borders of Russia, so no annexations, no kind of uh, no Kaliningrad, whatever, turning into Prussia and rejoining Germany. No, 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 no. This will be Kaliningrad. Will be a free state. It can change its name. If they want the people there, or it will be Kaliningrad was a communist, or uh, Kalinin. Oh, I hope they will change it. But that's up to them. And then they will be a free, independent state. They will be in the UN. They can join the UN NATO then, same like Estonia. But no way there will be change of borders. Yeah? You know, no change of borders. And of course, in some areas, it's very difficult because you have a lot of messing about of Stalin, especially in the North Caucasus. And there is complications, and that uh, is very complicated in two uh, three instances. I've looked at it in detail, but uh, you know the principle is: yeah, no Chinese encroachments, no Japanese encroachments, no American encroachments. Nobody has a right to any territory of any of the existing of the to be uh, founded new states, the republics and the oblasts. That depends on the internal division line. They will turn into new states. And that's how it will be, and nobody will have any uh, talk uh, in changing borders. Yeah, that cannot be. And for the regional problems, because there is overlapping minorities, uh, there is regional minorities in some regions, and there might be a lot of unfairness and injustice felt by some and by others not. So for them, we have regional minority status. So it must be recognition of the language, uh, training and education in the minority languages and respect for the minorities and regional self-representation in regional uh, systems like we have it in southern Tyrol or uh, for, the fin uh, for the Swedes in Finland or mm, uh, for mm, the Albanians in Macedonia and so we have many of these examples and that's the way but no change of borders no kind of complete mess no civil war no external interventions yeah but uh, a peaceful breakup and where there is no peaceful breakup there might be some wars and there might be some tragedy but it has to be tried to be avoided and to learn from the example of um, what was not possible because Ra Serbia was waging a war of aggression against Slovenia, Croatia, Bosnia and then Kosovo and it was a terrible crime and today still the bully. So if we can avoid to create a big core Russia like Serbia today with an aggressive revanchist agenda and with nuclear arms and the UN Security Council seat a lot will people would survive in the future. And of course, we have to be early ready, the countries who want to be free, to defend them as well and to guarantee them inside NATO or with other form of security guarantees. Because as we see, Russia can only be contained uh, once countries are in NATO, because if they are not in NATO, they are easy prey, as it is in the case of Ukraine. And I advocated for Ukraine to be as a divided, partly occupied country in NATO already in 2017 when I was working there and I got so much pushback. But I remind that a divided, partly occupied uh, Western Germany was allowed to join NATO in 1955 and it was safe ever since and it got very rich and it helped with its resources to be part of the victory success story of the West in the Cold War. And it's now an ally still and it's still today American troops there and of course uh, they are uh, very much needed uh, to defend Ukraine today. So NATO integration for new countries should be not off the agenda, on the contrary, when they want, yeah, they can and they will. And that's of course, I think, the good way forward. In the case of Crimea, let me say it that way, I'm very much in favor of um, Ukraine joining NATO, EU and adopting the Euro now. That's very important, start with the Euro. Uh, make it clear as a part of the peace agreement Ukraine um, still divided in uh, NATO and then uh, to have also unification possible by uh, basically uh, Crimea then voting to join NATO, uh, EU, Euro, Ukraine in a future of freedom because they will then have the choice to either whatever uh, be an independent country or uh, rejoin, um, that will be the only possible, uh, of course, in Donbass as well, where the option of unification with Ukraine will be on the table because they are legally part of Ukraine. And that is what I always call on Twitter, the military, uh, not the military option for unification, but the politically, like in the case of Germany. Yes.
that's for Ukraine. And I think I covered most of the issues. It's half an hour video. I want to say your work is excellent and that's my contribution to this uh, work. Uh, I want to say thanks a lot for inviting me. I cannot attend the December event, but I will be fully available in 2023 because this will be the dominant issue after victory in Ukraine and NATO accession in the East, what many of the Western European appeasers and the protectionists and the populists and the Russian paid lobbyists in politics, what they believe in is that we go to the status quo ante with Russia back, Putin will live forever and there will be happiness and gas will flow and the ruble will roll. No, 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 it will not be like this. It will be a big crisis. And the concept you're developing is the, to avoid or to at least manage the crisis of the breakup of Russia in a decent way. That's why your work is so important and that's why your work uh, deserves a lot of international attention because if we can manage a more peaceful dissolution uh, of uh, Russia into um, somehow a peaceful area of prosperity based on European values, democracy and standards, yeah? like uh, it was now possible after the war in um, Yugoslavia and mostly it has completed process is still going on, but let's not forget Slovenia, Croatia is already in uh, um, NATO and in EU. That's a big out of seven countries, two fully integrated. They go have the Euro now, Croatia. They will join Schengen. That's really good. And you have also then uh, Montenegro, Macedonia already in uh, NATO as well on the way to the EU. That's really very good. And you just need to recognize Kosovo fully, especially Ukraine. That would be so important and so good. And then uh, Bosnia, of course, uh, both in NATO. And then it's only Serbia, which is the problem. But nevertheless, economically, it's also packed to the euro. And uh, it's very highly dependent and integrated in the European economy. So the situation is more or less fine. And if we can achieve something like that uh, for the post-Russian uh, space, for ex-Russia, that would be wonderful and the less border conflicts, the less uh, civil war situations and the less um, crisis, uh, the better, obviously, and the less costly for Europe and the European taxpayers. But we need to be mentally prepared. And if we have a decent concept how to structure everything, how to divide themselves, basically, how the, uh, the falling apart uh, Russian Federation can be put into an existing decent framework of policy making, then I think many of the conflicts will simply not uh, take place and it's much better for the people, much more people will be alive. And uh, let's never forget, we are really talking about life and death questions. Because if the people would have heard, uh, listened to me and, uh, and uh, not just me, <laughs> Poroshenko especially, to have um, uh, Ukraine still divided, but in NATO, EU and the Euro <laughs> in that time, in 2017, all this terrible war with it now, plus 150,000 death and two trillion costs, uh, they would have been avoided. So um, policy really is a question of matter of life and death. So your work is very important. The better you can prepare yourself on these institutional issues and communicate uh, to the world that this is the future of ex-Russia and that uh, we are getting uh, acquainted uh, to and the future of ex-Russia mentally and to all these names from Komi, Karelia, from Yakutsk and from Porazia, from Amur to Dagestan, Chechenia, to also many, I don't know all the names by heart myself, yeah. but that uh, Siberia, Ural, I can say more. Now what else can I say? Komi, I mentioned Karelia, Königsberg, yeah. and then I have, uh, what else on the agenda? Um, Chechenia, um, Dagestan, Ingushetia, Circassia, Alania, and of course uh, Kuban and all these places will be free and so will be of course uh, um, uh, Tartarstan and Bashka Hortistan and uh, Mariel and all these beautiful places will be free independent states and they can form uh, union federations in the future but first of all they must be free and independent states and that's actually a fantastic future and if we can prepare this debate uh, good, and that is absolutely necessary and it will be a very good um, period of for the world to have all and the people and, and the resources and uh, the end of this constant threat east of Europe. If that is uh, the future, I think it will be wonderful for the people of Russia. They will be free 
they will have many many more opportunities they will be free from the shackles of the moscow yoke and they will be also part of the global economy and that's a wonderful future to work for i wish you thanks and uh, good luck for all your deliberation and the important work you're doing and here from vienna i call for freedom of the free people of russia and for most important right now for an end of this terror war and for ukraine in nato uh, the eu and the euro as a currency and that's the most immediate uh, to defeat russia in the battlefield to provide all the weapons we have in europe and in america to uh, the ukrainians uh, to defeat russia and please let me end with a free mariupol slava ukraine and for victory of ukraine and for the integration of ukraine in nato and in the eu as a role model as a lighthouse tower as a model uh, for the whole of the former um, russian uh, state and federation and for freedom of the free people of russia thanks a lot more to come from pax arupiana and for freedom globally and as well for the people of ex-russia bye